Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venetia from The Woolly Worker and this is The Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast channel. As you can probably tell from the title, this will not be a usual episode, it's a special episode where I will knit and chat with you. So a couple of episodes ago I asked you guys to ask me questions in the comment section of YouTube and also I asked you that on Instagram where you can follow me, at The Woolly Worker, by the way, for uh, behind the scenes stories and polls and questions and, of course, seeing finished items and works in progress, Instagram photos. And you can also follow me on Ravelry at The Woolly Worker for way more in-depth comments on um, the yarn choices, the yarn colors, grams, quantities, needle sizes, measurements. I try and keep Ravelry very... Um, thorough and detailed and while I'm at it I might as well tell you that I also try and keep the uh, description box of my YouTube videos very detailed so if you're looking for information definitely check those three places but yeah like I said it's gonna be a knit and chat and I'm really excited and a little bit nervous about it as well because first of all I'm not that good at knitting without looking so I'm worried that this entire episode is going to be either me chatting away and not knitting or knitting without ever looking at the camera but I thought it could be really fun to do, to do this, so let's let's give it a go. And if it works, then we can have more of these. I got quite a lot of questions. Thank you so so much. If you're one of those who asks something, it means the world that you took the time of the day to do that, and it gave me a lot of things to talk about. So can do this without you. And because there's a lot of questions, there can definitely be more of these in the future because I don't think I'll get around to answering them all today. Before we start, I'll just mention what I'm wearing. I'm wearing the Eclair Pullover. Um, it's from Beautiful Knitters. And I talk about this at length in podcast episodes, I think, two and three. Definitely three, which you can check out on the channel. This is made with Isiger Eco Soft in the colorway 4S. It's a beautiful sweater. It's got a split hem just at, under the underarm. And it's really comfy, it's got nice balloony like bracelet length sleeves and it's just really comfortable. And because the yarn is made of like cotton and alpaca, it's quite breathable and I find that I don't overheat in it, which is great for this kind of weather where it's starting to get a bit warmer. And I'm coming to you from a very cloudy Edinburgh, but the sun is peeking out every now and then, so I hope that the lighting doesn't change too, too much over the course of the video. But if it does, it's fine. We're here to listen anyway, I guess not really watch, because I might insert some b-roll for some of the questions if it's relevant, but I think I'll just mostly keep this chill and, let me just say it, low effort as possible. And there will be a future podcast episode, I guess, soon enough, where I will chat about the updates. So... Yeah, that's what I'm wearing, and then what I will be working on is my loom sweater by Sorry Nordland. So let me just show you what I've got so far. I've got quite a lot since I last showed you my false start, where I had problems with gauge. So this is the first time I'm showing it on camera then, and this is really, really good and exciting. So I've done the whole yoke, I've done both of the sleeves, and I'm just working stockinette in the body. I was trying to get a project where I could work in stockinette for this episode. To try and make it easier. Also I'm sorry if you see me like pulling yarn and if you can hear the needles clicking. Like I said it's my first time doing a knit and chat so we'll learn from this but I hope that you grab yourself a project to work on and for the next I don't know half hour 45 minutes we'll be knitting along together to whatever project. Let me know in the comments what you're working on I love reading those and so it's very exciting to see the variety of projects people choose to work on. So I've got my list of questions here on my computer and I've divided them into basically two categories. There's going to be knitting questions and non-knitting questions and I'm going to start with the knitting because I guess that's what the majority of people are going to be here for but if you want to stick around until the end there will be a couple of non-knitting questions as well. So yeah I'll put the questions on the screen as well so you can see what was asked and let's get started. So the first question was how did you learn how to knit? What made you want to start? So I'm not going to spend too, too much time talking about this because I actually did talk about all of that in my video that I posted, which is like my knitting journey. And this is where I talked about my first few projects. So basically my first project was a scarf, a striped Harry Potter scarf with Lion Brand wool. 
and it was a tube and it was very boring but it was good to learn the knit stitch I guess and also like joining in the round um, but I guess there wasn't that many m more things to learn so I guess it wasn't that good beginner project because you only learn a couple skills what made me want to start was that I've always been quite a creative person with lots of artsy craftsy hobbies I used to draw a lot that was my main hobby back when I was younger and I guess like kind of DIY and like building crafting things making things I quite liked doing that and when I moved to Scotland started uni I was looking for a hobby you know having that freedom of having a lot of free time after uni and the possibility that I could maybe join clubs and societies I was like I need to find myself something to do here and I was doing color pencil drawings for a lot for like the couple first years at uni then I decided to learn how to knit and I didn't really like it but I learned how to and then I learned how to crochet and then I was crocheting a lot for the next two years and then decided to give knitting again like a go because I thought maybe because of now my crochet experience might make it more enjoyable to knit and I was kind of bored of crocheting I was doing a lot of hats, blankets um, like house decor stuff and I had tried a cardigan and crochet but it was awful and I knew that if I wanted to make garments I should try and give knitting a go because that craft lends itself better to the drape of garments etc so I gave knitting another go and like I said, if you want to check the projects that I did, you can check that video where I talk about them. But after a few sort of failed attempts that weren't bringing that much joy, I discovered Fair Isle and that was really enjoyable. By the way, another question was how did I learn how to knit? And that was through YouTube. Everything was just tutorials, you know, I would pick a pattern that maybe had like one or two skills I didn't know so that I would learn with each pattern like it was really enjoyable to sort of unlock new skills one by one and not just keep doing beginner things I feel like when beginners ask like oh when is it time to do an intermediate pattern I think you just have to take the plunge and do the intermediate pattern and that's how you become not a beginner but everybody has different learning styles so yeah basically to answer the question then what made me want to start was that I wanted to knit garments and I've not stopped since I have made a lot of jumpers I actually wonder okay I will put it on the screen when I'm editing I will put how many jumpers and cardigans I have made and slipovers so yeah that's what I've done since taking it seriously in July 2022 so eight nine months ago what is my favorite cast on and cast off I like that one because it's gonna be quite easy to answer my favorite cast on I guess in the sense that is the one I use the most is the German twisted cast on I remember learning the long tail cast on and using that for a while and then once I had learned how to do the German twisted one I kid you not I think I have lost my, the muscle memory to do the long tail cast on so if you ask me now to do a long tail I couldn't because my hands would naturally do the German twisted cast on so that's my favorite but I have done a few projects that use the tubular cast on for like the balloon sweater and the louvre sweater by Petite Knit and I absolutely adore it of course it's not going to be relevant for every single knit but if I were to make a cardigan or a sweater bottom up which I'm thinking of doing this year probably then I would definitely do the tubular cast on to get that polished look and I like how it mirrors the tubular cast off and then that will be my answer for my favorite bind off that's going to be the tubular bind off where you do the two set of rounds of double knitting and then you take your needle like a sewing darning needle and you go through so it's a sewn bind off if you're familiar with it you know why I love it so much it looks extremely polished and seamless and if you don't know what I'm talking about and what it is please go look up the Italian bind off a lot of people hate it and it's like their least favorite part but I actually love it I find it very intuitive and repetitive I am able to undo mistakes if I make any I can go back and, and un sew it and also I don't need to look at anything like it's very um, fast to do so it doesn't take that long even if the whole body of the sweater is like 400 stitches I don't think that's annoying 
the only thing I would say is that it, it is not easy to unpick. So if you have to unpick it, people say to just like, cut it, which is fine, I guess. As opposed to like the, the when you knit and bind off and you can just like un unravel it all, that's easier for when you make mistakes. So with the Italian bind off, definitely make sure that you don't need to go and undo anything afterwards. What knit are you the most looking forward to to cast on? That's a really good question, and it actually caused a lot of umming and erring. It caused a lot of indecisiveness because if you've watched any of my planning videos, you know that I have a lot. And I know it can seem a bit overwhelming, and maybe it is, but that's just how I like to work. Uh, I like to have a wide array of things I want to do because I never know what mood I'm going to be in. So I just like to, to know. And sometimes I'm in a project planning mood, which some might argue is a different hobby than knitting. You know, when you're planning for your knits, that's like a whole different game. Sometimes I'm in the mood to plan, and sometimes I'm in the mood to knit. So when I want to knit, I'm happy that I've got this huge list of already determined like patterns, yarns I'm going to use, sometimes modifications I'm going to do, I already know in advance. So I do like planning a lot, but it does make me very excited to do them all, almost in equal weight. But if I had to answer now, today, as of today, the one I'm the most looking forward to, I think, is the Dartmoor Sweater by Kadri. I talked about that in my latest videos where I was saying that one of my goals this year is to knit a black sweater. So I was saying that I was going to use a combination of yarns with one very dark grey and one strand of lace alpaca in black for a bit of a like deeper colour that would be interesting and also so as to not use mohair and I'm choosing this pattern because it's a drop shoulder oversized look with a nice shoulder detail I think it's going to be timeless and I want it to be a project that I can just like throw on no matter what I'm wearing and that it would be comfy so definitely want to use yarns that are soft and I've bought the yarn uh, recently, so that made me very, very excited to start it. I've had a few comments like highly recommending the pattern, and it, I, it says that it works up really fast, so that's also something to look forward to for that instant gratification. It looks like, because it's a drop shoulder as opposed to a raglan, I feel like there's more steps in a drop shoulder, which makes it more interesting, as opposed to just an entire body of stockinette. Like, there will be a bit of back and forth, there's the eye cord, like, shoulder detail. So it just looks like an, a, a perfect mix of interesting but not complicated and not endless stockinette because it's at a big gauge. I think it's like 16 or 15 stitches per 4 inches, so it'll work out pretty fast. So that's my final answer, that's why I'm the most looking forward to knitting and I think I want to maybe try and do it sooner rather than later because it's going to be warm, it's going to be black, it's not going to be the most summer appropriate garment, so I'd like to get somewhere out of it. It's Scotland, it's going to be cold, I know I'll be wearing it in May probably, maybe even some like cold nights in June. So yeah, I, I'll try and do that maybe, maybe next. I'm, I'm doing my loom sweater right now, I've cast on a sweater for my boyfriend, so maybe it's going to be my next sweater after that. Next question is, what needles do you like to use? And I really like this question because I don't think I'm ever going to make a video that's just about needles because the simple answer is that I only use one brand set, which is the Xiaogu interchangeable red lace needles. I also talk about that in my like knitting journey video where one December, one cold COVID December, I treated myself to that set because I knew I really liked knitting and I wanted to see where I was going to take that and I knew that having the right tools could make the hobby more enjoyable. I didn't want to keep working with my horrible wooden needles from Amazon that were so flimsy and felt awful against most yarns because that might put me off of the hobby entirely and there's an argument for the fact that you can have the best tools and be a bad craftsman the tools aren't going to make up for that bad craftsmanship. But there's also the argument that even the best knitter, if they were given horrible needles and horrible yarn, 
they might not make something very good. So I thought it was worth investing. And also because a lot of the time when you're making sweaters, you need a lot of different needle sizes. Most of the time I don't even read it anymore when designers put the cable length in the details because I know I have them all. Because of the Chayo Guset, you get a wide variety of different cables and you can buy extras. And then the combinations of these in combination with needle tips, you can really, really like be as flexible as you need. Since then, I've also bought the Chayogu mini set and then the like shorties. So one of them is red and one of them is blue. I'll show them on B-roll probably. Uh, one of them basically has the ranges from like five millimeter, five millimeters to like 3.5 millimeters. And then one has the 3.5 all the way down to two millimeters. So with that, you also get tips that are like a certain length and then even smaller tips. So basically now I've got three pairs of tips and a, and a big amount of cables for each needle size. It's great. I love these because the cables have never betrayed me. Like some of you may know, the Chayogu are known to have a cable with Oh, I can't remember if it has memory or no memory, but basically it never bends and you never have to put it in water. There's no creases. It's not the one that has the, um, the metal bit where the needle joins the cable, the swivel. It doesn't have a swivel. So sometimes I have noticed that if I'm putting a lot of like tension or pressure, sometimes the tips like untwist themselves. But I noticed that, I noticed that the needle becomes looser and then I can just like pop a T-pin back in the hole and tighten it. And honestly, I don't know if it's because of the way that I knit or like the needles themselves, but I haven't found that to happen too much and I've never considered that an inconvenience. I know some people have been put off by this with the needles where they have to tighten them like every project, but I haven't found that to be the case and I'm always at my desk anyway with my knitting supplies so I can always tighten it if need be. So that's why I really like them. They are, you know, I guess a little pricey for the initial investment, but then because of what I just said with how much, how many combinations of, of needle tips and cable length you've got, that covers you. And only really recently, I found myself to be like running out of cable space and needle space because I guess I've had a lot of projects that are using the same needle sizes and doing a lot of sweaters, I guess, which are using that like large cable or medium sized cable. So I'm kind of running out of needles. But I remember, I think it's Florence who said that, she, Florence from Handmade by Florence, she says that she doesn't want to buy more sets because having only one set forces her to like clear off the needles and, and knit a bit more monogamously. So I think the fact that I only have that one set is preventing me from casting on too much that I can handle. So I definitely recommend the set. Absolute good value, good investment, good quality. The tips are like as sharp as they need to be. Sometimes I guess I wish they were a tad sharper because if I'm doing some lace, it could be handy but I don't tend to pick a lot of patterns that have lace. I guess I'm more of a texture or color work person for when I'm doing those projects or otherwise if it's plain stockinettes for like staple kind of jumpers, then I like that. I'm not really knitting a lot of lace sweaters, but I do lace socks sometimes, which brings me to the second part of the question. When I'm not using my Chayogu, I am using, I think it's Knit Pro, and it's the 80 centimeter cable, and usually it's the two millimeter or the 2.25 millimeter needle size. Those are for socks. And I just bought those on Amazon, which I know, the devil, but that was a long time ago. So I just use these for socks and it's really handy. I don't do them two at a time, but what I might do is get like two pairs of needles for each size so that I can make them like step by step. So not two at a time on the same needle, but just working the cuff on one, the cuff on the other, the heel on one, the heel on the other. Because I do get second sock syndrome a lot and it's really hard to be motivated. 
But yeah, those are the needles that I use. Super happy with it. I guess the one thing that's missing are wooden needles, which I would really like to try on my gift list if I'm ever gonna buy them. It's gonna be the Seenit bamboo needles because I've heard amazing things about them. I was tempted to maybe buy one fixed pair of CNET to see if I like it, but I've heard, I can't remember from which YouTuber, I think it was maybe Alexandra from Alexandra's Garn that says that the fixed CNETs actually feel quite different from the interchangeable CNET, and so buying one to test out how the other feels might not be the best idea. But yeah, I've told my boyfriend if he wants to get me that for my birthday in July or Christmas, then he knows that's like the holy grail of needles. Because I think it would be good to try wooden needles, especially to, to change my gauge without necessarily going down or up a needle size. That would be quite nice to see the effect. And also because of some yarns, like for example, silk, I've heard it's recommended to use wooden needles to increase friction and reduce slip, slippy, slippery stitches. So yeah, that was for needles. What knitting technique do you want to try but are too afraid to do right now? That's a really good question. Again, in the knitting goals video I just posted, I mentioned wanting to try sticking, but yeah, I don't think I'm too afraid to do that right now. I think I'm ready to do that. So the real one that I'm too afraid to do is intarsia. So basically when I was choosing my goals for the year, I was thinking of all the techniques and I was thinking that there's actually quite a lot that I can do. So I'm really happy with that. And the one, you know, my Moby Dick, my Everest, is in Tarja because, first of all, it's just, it never came up. There hasn't been that many projects I've seen on Ravelry or Instagram that are in Tarja that I was attracted to. If I saw one that was in Tarja that I needed to do, then yeah, sure, I'd be more motivated to try the skill. But here, I don't really want to learn how to do it just for the sake of learning how to do it if there's no big, nice project at the end. To motivate me. However, I have asked my boyfriend when we're brainstorming sweaters I can make him. I've asked him what sweaters he, he likes. So whenever I see one that I think he'll like on Instagram or Ravelry, I show him my phone and I'm like, do you like this? Imagine it in different colors. Like, do you like... It's hard as well because whenever I show him a pattern, he's like, oh yeah, but I don't like the color. And I'm like, well, disregard the color. The color is what's easy to modify. Do you like the pattern? And then I show him like different versions on Ravelry and Instagram. Um, so I was showing him sweaters and we've selected a few. And very early on, I showed him one from Max the Knitter. I forgot the name, but I'll put it here and I'll put a photo. And he said that he loved that one. So first of all, the yarn that really is important for this effect, like the black and the khaki camouflage type, is from Max the Knitter's own brand of hand-dyed yarn, which is very inaccessible and very expensive. So I cannot get him that yarn. I've looked into it and I, I can't. And it's gonna be really hard to substitute. But I found someone do that with Sennes Garn Duo, I think, in a very nice desert colorway, like Desert Island, Sahara, Desert. I don't know, I'll put a photo to tell you, to show you what I'm talking about. And he liked that colorway as well. So we've kind of agreed that that would be a nice color for him and... But the pattern itself is intarsia, I'm pretty sure. And it's also intarsia in the round, although I might have to check. So whether it's intarsia or intarsia in the round is just something that looks extremely complicated. It also has some color work section and not just intarsia, I think. Sorry, I should have looked into this more. But I remember laughing in his face when he said that he wanted me to make that because like, out of all the things I can do, that is one I can't do. But I'd love to learn how to do that for him. I think it would be... It's a beautiful, beautiful sweater and one of the rare ones that motivated me to learn in Tarja. So, yeah, that's a technique I'd like to do. Just really not right now. Not on a male sweater. And I know that in Tarja flat is not the worst thing in the world. It's in Tarja in the round that things start to get complicated. But we'll see. Other question is, have you tried de-peeling razors? And the answer is no, I have not. And I've not really needed to. So like I said, I've only been 
really knitting since July last year and I've made a fair few a fair amount of sweaters with mohair or alpaca which are known to, to not need depilling and I've made a couple things with like rough wools which again they don't need that either so I've not made that many things with merino I know that Send this garden double Sunday is one that's known to require deep peeling. And I have a couple sweaters with that. The Marseille sweater and sweater number 23. And I've only recently started wearing those. So they've gotten, I don't know, maybe like six outings each. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but yeah, that's what I've I've been wearing them so far. And they haven't pilled at all but I know that if I'm ever noticing pills on my sweaters that makes them look very unfinished and you know low quality I probably will invest in a deep piller and try it some people have mentioned just using razors I'm absolutely terrified of that I don't know how to use razors I'm too scared of cutting myself I will not use a razor on my knits, thank you very much. I'll just get those little like electric de-shavers things. But I haven't used any so far and I haven't needed to and I'm quite glad about that because I don't want my knits to be high maintenance. Like after the fact. Okay, so a very popular question was what is my favorite yarn? If I could only knit with one yarn for the rest of my life, what would it be? Favorite yarn or yarn combination? So I'll answer those a bit differently because I think they mean different things. I think the favorite yarn combination that's going to be like basically a merino and a brushed Surrey alpaca. So like yeah, brushed Surrey alpaca silk blend which I've actually only swatched with when I was swatching for my Monday sweater with my like Zakami hand-dyed Surrey brushed alpaca. I had never knitted with anything so soft in my entire life. And it made me so, so, so excited to try that. And actually what I'm gonna do for that project is I'm on the lookout right now for a yarn that will be a merino and silk blend to make it even softer. But even when swatching with a merino and that Surrey alpaca, I was amazed by how great and soft it felt. Definitely softer than mohair. So I'm definitely gonna be searching and seeking more of like Surrey brushed alpaca projects. I know that obviously hand dyers have a lot of those like, available and they're going to be hand dyed but I'm not too sure of other brands that do brushed alpaca. I have the Drops brushed alpaca which was great but I wasn't amazed by it as I was with the Zakami one. So if you know of any brands that do brushed Surrey alpaca mixes let me know and I'll try them. I think Sandus Garn might be doing one so I'll maybe buy that next time I do a send this garn order but it shouldn't be too soon because I've got quite a lot to work with now then a question was like if I could only use one yarn for the rest of my life what would it be and I think that would be the send this garn Sunday because they have a lot of colors a lot of very very nice colors that all fill different gaps like they've got really bright brights and really nice neutrals the other good thing of getting a fingering weight yarn is how versatile that would be because I could hold it single for a fingering weight sweater in merino, I could hand it, hold it double for a DK weight merino sweater, I could make so much, so many sweaters with that, like let's assume I had an unlimited supply of it in the scenario where I can only knit with one yarn. And then I could make socks, which Granted, they probably would not wear very well, but that's what fingering weight can get you. And also, I guess, yeah, depending on the needle size, I could knit at all the different gauges and it would be good. So like I said, it's merino, it's really soft, it feels nice, like it's not too dry. It blocks really nicely. I've used it, I think, with mohair exclusively. I've not used it alone yet, but I'm planning to make the Friday tea by Petite Knit, which is like a striped sweater, and that's going to be just made in the merino. So the reason I haven't done that yet is because I think it's all over rib, which is a little 
high maintenance. But I'm excited about using that yarn because I really like it. So that's the yarn I would use if I could only have one. You can agree or disagree with my reasons. It was a really, really hard question to answer. Um, so yeah, thank you for asking that. And then favorite yarn ever, like, but not, not if I could only knit with it, but just my favorite yarn. I think that would be um, the Fiber Company Lore. I really loved it. So it's a woolen spun yarn. It's really lofty and airy and light. They also had an amazing color selection with amazing color names and good practices the company has. It's, I think that one is just 100% lamb's wool, but I'm, it made me so impressed with the company that I went and looked up at their different other bases and I am so sold. They've got, I think they're known to have those very interesting blends. One of them is called Road to China Light and it has, what doesn't it have? I think it has camel, which is very interesting. It has silk, it has maybe merino, alpaca, definitely. So basically anything that is soft that you can think of, it has it. So I want to try that one. So I guess I'm, I'm cheating because I, I haven't worked with that. But that's one that I feel if I worked with it, I would fall in love with it. It's quite pricey, so I don't think it's something I'm going to have many garments made out of. But once I find the right garment or project for it, then I think I might give it a go. I just haven't really found anything that struck inspiration yet. And then very interestingly, I had a question that was, what's your least favorite yarn to use? And if you're here for the drama and the gossip, then listen out. I'm looking at my stash here and I, I was thinking of, of which one was my least favorite and I can't really see it in my stash because if I hate it, I'm not gonna have lots of it. And it's a yarn that I bought, yeah, over a year ago when I was beginning to learn how to knit. And I thought I would make a sweater out of it. And that was like me kind of still being in the crochet world where Lion Brand is a really good brand for like affordable crochet yarns. And they do a lot of acrylic, which for crochet is like a perfectly good yarn to use, but for garments, like not so much because it doesn't have the nice wool properties like elasticity and like moisture repellent and, and everything. So I wanted to make an RN cable sweater, which was very optimistic and ambitious of me. And I saw on Ravelry that for this free pattern I was using, the Honeycomb RN, a lot of people were using Lion Brand, Fisherman's Wool. And I liked the name, Fisherman's Wool. I was attracted to that because I liked Jameson of Shetland Spinrift, for example, and I thought this was going to be the same. But it's not. That wool is so incredibly rustic. It feels like rope. I guess it was giving some definition to the cables, but it was awful to work with. Like when the yarn was slipping in my hands between my fingers, it was genuinely like sometimes a bit hurtful, like hurting. And I'd need to moisturize my hands a lot. And I thought that there was no way in hell this was going to be nice on my body. It was heavy. The pattern was complicated to read. The yarn was not great. So it's no wonder I never finished. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you hear that? It's lunchtime. Um, it's no wonder I never finished that project. It was just awful. And the worst part, I guess, is that I bought so much yarn for it. I think they sell them in like big, like, hanks of yarn. I got four of those and I've used one for the back panel. So I've got like one and a half. So I've got two and a half left of these. I have no idea what to do with them. They're very quite like significant in size. I'm not too bitter about having paid for them. Like they were not too expensive and it was affordable like for me at the time. It's just that I was looking at alternatives like, okay, like let's keep the yarn. What else can we do with it? And nothing, there's nothing I can see myself do. And I think that's the sign of a bad yarn, I guess, debatable, is like if you really can't think of anything that it could be suitable with, like not even plan A, B or C or whatever, so if you've made anything with Lion Brand Fisherman's Wool, let me know. I've seen a few people make, dare I say, the, the Dartmoor sweater with Fisherman's Wool, I think, because they have a Tweedy one. 
My one was the colorway Oatmeal, which was nice and neutral. Some people have a, a Tweety version of it and it looks great, but like having worked with it, having it here, I'm wondering how this person can put, put that on their body. And I know obviously everyone has different tolerances and, and feels, but for me personally, that's the worst yarn I've ever worked with. And I'm annoyed that the fact I've got a lot in stash, a sweater quantities in stash that I know is never going to get used. So definitely on the to donate or trade pile because I can't. Uh, okay, so we're going to transition a little bit more to personal questions. So someone asked, I love your photos out in nature wearing your finished objects. Is it your partner that is your photographer? Well, thank you for saying that. And yes, he is. So he's really nice. And I hate taking photos of myself or videos. Well, well, this is fine, but I don't like taking videos of me modeling things. And yeah, he, he said that he didn't mind at all. And he likes going outside. He's a very happy, outdoorsy guy and happy to help. So I just gave him my phone and we just spend some time together. It's nice quality time. Like at first I don't like it because I'm like nervous and a bit embarrassed, but he always knows how to make it fun. Never complains. We're both learning, you know, neither of us come from a photography or anything like that, like background. So we've, we've we got a lot of bad photos and just not aesthetically pleasing or appealing. And we've got some bloopers, which I might show here as well. Yeah, yeah it's nice. I'm, I'm stalking you. <laughs> I swear, she's my girlfriend. I'm not just <laughs> filming her butt. Okay. <laughs> Finger gun. Whoa, whoa, give us, give us a quote, give us a quote. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay, I think that's enough for that one. Okay. Should I keep going or stop? I keep going, it's fine. I'll just take this. Mm. <laughs> it's always good fun. I don't like when it's time to make the b-roll for my videos. It's my least favorite part, but it's always worth it and we do end up having a good time afterwards. And it, it's just really worth having those videos. I think videos of finished objects are so great to demonstrate fit and ease and angles and details that photos might not be able to do. So yeah, I hope that he doesn't mind taking more and more videos as the year goes on and that I continue finishing objects. To lead on to that, have you knitted a jumper for your boyfriend? No, I have not, but I've just started. So you're seeing it here first. I have just made the color and I'm just doing the raglan increases. And this is the um, single mouth sweater by Maxim Sir. So we're definitely enjoying Maxim Sir as a designer. Uh, so this is my first jumper that I'm making for him. I hope he likes it. It's not a surprise, so he'll be trying it on like every step of the way. He's at work just now, but when he's coming tonight, I'll have him try on like just the neck, like the color to see how that looks already. And then when I'm done with the raglan increases that the pattern specifies, I'll have him try it on to see if I need to increase the yoke length, which I think I might have to based on pattern, like project comments on Ravelry. But yeah, he's been really worthy of his socks that he's received, like I said before, so I'm not worried at all about him enjoying this jumper. Another question is, um, do you want to be a knitting designer? And if yes, what kind of design? And the really quick answer is no, I don't want to, like at all. And you know, Caroline from Caroline Knits, she made a video all about her reasons why she doesn't want to be either and I basically agree with all of her reasons so I might do a video explaining those reasons in more detail to make it more personal and you know like to, to say what I think but honestly like she pretty much covers all of it with a couple like first reasons why being I don't have any good original ideas I have nothing that I can think of that hasn't already been made. Anytime that I want something, someone has already made a pattern for it and any kind of small improvements that I can do on that pattern doesn't deserve its own pattern. And of course you're going into risky like copyright infringement 
territory if you try and make improvements on someone's pattern and release that as your own that's not very ethical so i don't have any good ideas that deserve patterns and then secondly it seems like a lot of work and i work full time and the, doing this podcast is already taking quite a lot of free time so i don't I, I certainly do not see any space in the future for adding designing a sweater for that and of course there's rewards it's not like it's all work and no play but oh i dropped a stitch i'm pretty impressed that's just the first stitch i managed to drop in this video so yeah basically short answer no i do not want to be a designer of course i might change my mind i feel like a lot of podcasters start off as podcasters and end up being knitting designers it would be really funny if in six months we look back at this video and i've released the design but i really don't see that happening in the near or medium future okay and then leading on to a bit more of like even more personal questions that are even less knitting related a question that i got a lot from people was what do i do for work, what do I do for a living, am I studying? I do work. I came to Scotland to study eight years ago. I did a psychology degree at Edinburgh Napier University, which was so much fun, it was really great. It was before the pandemic, so I got to enjoy all that time like uninterrupted and, and just as good as it could be. And then I was staying in Edinburgh. I didn't quite know what to do. I knew I wanted to work like clinically, but if you are in the UK and you've done psychology, you know how hard and competitive it can be. Usually you have to try and do things to try and stand out before you get onto further training. Because with a psychology degree undergraduate, you can't really do anything in the psychological field. You really need postgraduate training or experience. So I was trying to get that. I did a bit of volunteering. I did a bit of support work. And then I got onto a master's in Glasgow. It was a master's of clinical and health psychology, which I thought would boost my CV and try and get more, like even more opportunities for, for training. The master's was a top master's, so it doesn't give you any training or experience. It's just about like expanding on your knowledge and research skills, doing your dissertation, trying to network as well, try and get like your foot in the door and make some connections in the field. We always joke that the psychology field in Scotland is so tiny, everybody knows each other. I'd be really curious to know if, if you've done a psychology degree in, like in Scotland or even in the UK, uh, let me know. And then that's when Covid happened and then after that I applied for and got on to training for a different masters and that was for a masters in applied psychology, it's called a CAP course in Scotland. It's one of its kinds, one year training that uh, gets you to be an accredited cognitive behavioral therapist. So CB CBT is what I do. And after the one year training, you have to get employment. It's not like guaranteed necessarily, but you get a good chance and you can call yourself an applied psychologist. So that's what I am. I'm an applied psychologist and I work for the NHS, which is our national health service. It took me a lot to get to where I am. It was a lot of competition and relentless like hours and study and stress. It's it's a race as well. It can be very like competitive and I feel like for a bit before I knew knitting, like I feel like psychology was kind of my hobby. Like just because of how that world and that field can take all of your attention and like there's not a lot of life work balance because your life becomes psychology. So I'm really grateful to have found knitting because I found that to be the perfect way of having like the hobby that is just for me and that is not psychology. So while I was training last year, it was very demanding and a lot of my like cohort classmates were complaining that they found it difficult to stop studying and to stop working because of like just how demanding the course was and training demands but I personally found it really good to have that hobby that really kept me sane during training and kept me like happy and healthy until the end like I could see the end of the tunnel even though it was demanding of my time I had that like one thing to look forward to which was knitting you know and so yeah I guess that's kind of related to, to knitting 
and really happy to have gotten this job that's remote because that really works better for me and my lifestyle. So I'm a qualified CAP or a qualified applied psychologist and what we do in the service is if people get referred for like mild to moderate mental health difficulties like anxiety, depression, but also OCD, phobia, social anxiety, binge eating, you know, a, a lot of those mental health problems that affect people's obviously well-being and to some extent their functioning, they can get referred by their GP, their like primary, like primary care general practitioner, like first line, they get referred to our service and then they get offered CBT, which is provided by me. And yeah, I really enjoy it. I feel like that's pretty much what I've been working for my entire adult life. Like ever since moving to Scotland, that was the goal. And now I've got it. I finished training, I'm qualified. There's no, there's no more rat race. I feel like that was very overwhelming when we were all like psychology undergrads and we all wanted to, to do the next big thing and to make it in this world, this psychology world. It was very exhausting mentally. And I feel like now that I got to where I want to be, I'm so much calmer. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too much of a ramble. But if, if you're interested in that and you know, if you've been through the same thing, like either professionally or, or in psychology, and you know what I'm talking about, then I, I hope that resonated with you. But all that to say that now I'm much more able to have a good like work-life balance. I do my work as a CBT therapist and then I log off the computer and I knit. And yeah, a couple more people have asked, do I have any other hobbies like than knitting? And jokingly, I can say that, yeah, like knitting, planning, and then yarn buying are my two other hobbies. But seriously, I used to do crochet a lot. Like I said, I'll show a couple pictures of like some of my work if I uh, remember, but I haven't crocheted in a while because knitting brings like much more joy at the moment. It is really bright in here. I hope that's fine. But yeah, I really enjoyed crocheting. I used to enjoy drawing. I used to enjoy like having plants and stuff, but I'm not a really good gardener and most of my house plants have not like made it, but I still have a few. And yeah. And it's okay. I, I know some people say, you know, you have to diversify, you have to have more than one hobby. It's like, I don't think that you have to have anything. I know that my life is pretty like is separated into three big categories at the moment like the last few months what it's been is, is just very like knitting work and my partner and those are like the things that consume my thoughts for the day like over 24 hours or when i'm not sleeping and those are the things that bring me joy and that i do day to day like when i'm not knitting i'm like going on dates with my boyfriend or like working. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do now, day to day, which is great. I'm really enjoying that. And if things have to change or change later, that's also fine. Like I said before, like when you, when I was really into psychology and all of that, then that was also occupying a great space in my mind. And it was quite overwhelming to have like so many building blocks of thoughts. I really hope this makes sense. I didn't realize I was gonna have so many things to say about those questions, but it's interesting when you ask yourself, like, what do you like to do in your free time? That is such a big, vast question. And it makes you have to think and be introspective. Okay, and then the last question to kind of tie all of that was like, why did you move to Scotland? Is it hard being an expat? Do you miss Belgium? And what language do you speak? So I speak French as my first language. I don't speak any other languages. We could choose between learning Dutch or English at school. And I chose English. And I was always very, very attracted to like the English language and speaking it. I remember just being obsessed with like, I wish I 
could learn English and speak it so well that I would forget French, was what I used to say. And funnily enough, that has almost become true because I really don't speak French much on a day-to-day -day basis, like at all. Sometimes it can be months, like at, at the very definite least weeks before I speak out loud French or write in French. And so it, it really disappears. I used to go home to Belgium like more when I was at uni. And then ever since like COVID and, and now as a working adult, I don't go as much. And when I do go, it's for like three, four days and I'm just a mess, a complete mess. I cannot form sentences that make sense to anyone. And my family has to really uh, try to bridge the gap by understanding my broken grammar. But it's fine. Si vous parlez français, n'hésitez pas à laisser un commentaire. Et dites-moi si vous reconnaissez mon accent français dans mes vidéos. Je sais que c'est une blague un peu que les gens n'aiment pas l'accent français. Donc je pense que quand je suis arrivée en Écosse, j'ai essayé de le faire disparaître. Donc laissez-moi savoir si j'ai réussi ou pas. Some people have even messaged me enthusiastically in Dutch uh, or, you know, like Flemish, saying things. And it's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I know I said I was from Belgium, but I don't speak one of the two languages of Belgium. So I did not understand what they said. But I put it on Google Translate and we're all good. And no, I don't miss Belgium. I love Scotland. I moved there because it was like affordable, doable. They had free education for Europeans, which obviously they don't do anymore. So I got in at the right time. It, they speak English. It was very funny trying to learn like the Scottish accent because we pretty much learn American English in Belgium. So it doesn't translate super well. Well, it does. It's fine. There's just sometimes a couple of incidents where I say the American word instead of the English word and I get roasted. And initially my dream though was to move to Canada, by the way. I absolutely adore Canada. It holds a really special place in my heart. And maybe I will move there one day for like, you know, a few years or something. Like I don't want to go just like on holiday. I want to go and really experience it and settle there. But I don't know if I'm ready to leave Scotland. Like I really could see myself living the rest of my life here, which it's, it's the goal. Obviously have met some really great people here. I don't particularly want to start over in a new country all by myself. Although I could obviously convince my partner to come with me. Uh, I don't think that he wants to leave his family behind in Scotland. So yeah, I think that's it. I think I spoke a lot. I'm sorry if this was too long. I really enjoyed doing that. I feel like I was just chatting to a friend while knitting. So I really hope that felt like that for you too. I I actually don't know how much pro progress I did because I didn't put a progress marker. Actually, no, I joined New Yarn. So let me count the amount of rows I did in an hour. That's going to be not great, is it? Okay, seven rows. I did seven rounds on this body, which is not great. But I, yeah, I love doing this. This was a lot of fun. So I'll definitely want to make another one again. Even if you don't ask questions, I feel like those videos can be good for talking about knitting topics anyway like I could discuss construction types or like knitting trends or my opinions on some like controversial opinions and things like that I don't know give me ideas in the comments if you have other topics for knit and chat so not necessarily questions but just topics to discuss as you can see if I'm left unchecked I probably can and will ramble for a long time so it's good to know that there's content to be created here. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you soon for a next podcast episode. I'm really excited to talk about this loom sweater that I'm pretty much going to finish like next week, basically. Maybe, hopefully I'll be wearing this in the next video. That would be the goal. So I'd need to get that blocked pretty soon. And until then, enjoy yourself. Have a really great week. Have a good productive knitting time and if not productive let it be enjoyable but yeah bye everyone thanks for checking in oh okay i'm in this time this might not be the best <laughs>